now I'm embarrassed. I'm not going to say anything. Um, <clears throat> painted post. I love that. If you can imagine, like, if the first person who came into your town saw something and named the town for it, just what that would be. Um, I live in Arlington, Virginia, so I guess it would be five-sided building. You know, they would uh, call the town. I was actually, I was, I was flying into Washington one night at an airplane, and there was this woman sitting um, um, in the row in, um, in front of me. And she was uh, chatting with this guy who was flying into D.C. for the first time, and she was like a local, and she was pointing out things like landmarks on the ground to him as we were flying in. And she says, you see that, you see that octagon-shaped building down there? That's the Pentagon. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> Our educational system at its best, and really uh, doing well. Um, I'm really happy to, to be here again this year. I'm really uh, grateful to the Erie Canalway National Heritage Quarter for inviting me back. And, um, I love this event. I think it's, uh, it's kind of unique out there. I, I, I travel around a lot. I speak in a lot of events. Um, and this is uh, one of my favorites. I think there's just a nice synergy about um, digging into the issues that really bring people together in downtowns and making them relevant for preservation that is a, uh, a really nice thing. And I'm, I'm grateful to the, the staff of the, uh, of the corridor, um, Rosemary and Diane, who, of course, I ran into in the hotel bar last night. Um, Bob and Jean and uh, especially Hannah for for all her great work on this uh, on this conference um, and this one is a really uh, appealing topic I, I uh, you know approached it with great relish and I'm gonna try really hard to avoid puns uh, it's difficult to do um, this is such a rich topic and I hope I don't bite off more than I can chew <laughs> as I get into this um, what I'm going to do kind of is just give you sort of a cross, a cross sample of all the different kinds of issues related to food and lodging um, that come together in downtowns. Um, there are many, many, and this is just going to be an entree to that topic. Um, and I'm going to start with a little bit of prehistory and go back in time to how downtowns were when they functioned really well. Um, because, you know, downtowns were really marketplaces uh, for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, thousands of years. Downtowns have been the places where people did come together to, um, to, to run into each other, to buy food, to sell things. Um, it's where they would stay when they were traveling around. Um, and it doesn't take, you know, very much research to look back in uh, documentary evidence and see that that really is the reason that downtowns exist. They always were created at the intersection of the two busiest roads uh, going through an area. That's where a downtown popped up. They're natural marketplaces. And if you have a community that has a street called Market Street in it, or maybe Dock Street, um, it's pretty much a guarantee that your community was at one point a major um, market center, meaning a food marketplace, a place where farmers and fishers and hunters would bring food to be sold and distributed. Um, and there are you know, vestiges of markets still all over the country. Some communities have obviously revived them in recent years. Uh, they're now at the, at the the most recent count of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, there are something like 8,200 farmers markets uh, active in the U.S. That's up from uh, only about 500 20 years ago, so there's been an enormous uh, resurgent in farmers markets. And of course, they're almost all downtown because that is uh, the major transportation hub, uh, the central place in a community, a community's most, most public civic space, the place where everyone's uh, civil rights are always intact, no one's going to tell you you have to wear shoes or, you know, can't, can't ride a sidewalk. Um, and, you know, sometimes uh, these markets sort of come together casually, in this case just a bunch of uh, trucks backing up to a public square. Some communities, like in Buffalo, built market buildings to, uh, to house these activities on a permanent basis. But from the very beginning, markets uh, and food markets were a very important part of downtowns. Um, in the uh, 1800s, we began seeing sort of specialized food stores popping up uh, in the U.S., uh, fruit stores, vegetable stores. Um, this is a tea and coffee shop, um, fish market and barber shop. Now there's a combination for you, um, but a fish market. Uh, specialized places where you would go. And then there were some kind of significant revolutions. Um, it used to be that when you went into a grocery store, one of these food markets, the, the clerks would pick things for you. You couldn't just walk around and shop uh, on your own. And then a guy named Clarence Saunders uh, changed that in Memphis when he created Piggly Wiggly Grocery Store and actually allowed people to get their own food off the shelves. Um, and there's one of the first models of that. He didn't totally trust them, of course. You had to stay behind this barricade, but, um, but you could pull things off the shelves there and be checked out. There's a happy Piggly Wiggly shopper. Um, then uh, A&P, the Great Atlantic and Pacific uh, store, came up with another innovation, which was um, let's put everything together, make it more open, and make this into a national chain. And there were some small regional chains, but A&P really uh, blew this model out of the box and began opening stores 
uh, around the country. By 1930, there were 16,000 uh, AMP stores. Um, not too terribly coincidental. Uh, in uh, about the same time, in 1929, the first credit card was created in the U.S. And of course, it was the diner's card. It was meant to uh, to be used when people are, are dining out. So a lot of sort of food-related synergy happening when these big changes were about to happen in downtowns. People started moving to the burbs. Uh, food followed them. Retail follows people wherever it goes. Um, and convenience-oriented retail was the first food that would follow people out to the out to the suburban areas. Um, AMP, one of the one of the first movers out there. And you can just see as you look at photos from this era of the buildings getting bigger and bigger uh, and bigger as uh, the food system, the food distribution system, became completely uh, decentralized in a way, away from uh, producers bringing it directly into a town center, into a market town, and consumers buying it, and it now being taken to these. Uh, to these large places where food is shipped in, um, really losing a connection to who it was who's creating that food, who's supplying it, um, and how it got there. Uh, a dramatic change in food distribution, which was exactly parallel to other changes in shopping and retail in the US. You think about the development of uh, community shopping centers and then regional shopping malls, um, the growth of suburbs, the growth of the interstate highway system. It all falls exactly in line uh, with this change in food distribution. Um, then, as we've seen over the past decade or so, things have really begun to change. AMP filed for bankruptcy in uh, uh, um, uh, 2003, um, and a lot of the, uh, the, 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 the um, uh, major department store, um, grocery store chains are suffering, largely because of these guys. 25% of um, the nation's food is now sold by Walmart, um, and 55% of Walmart's sales are food sales. So they are a behemoth um, in this area. And that has affected a lot of the smaller regional and national chains uh, in food and made many of them into uh, uh, sort of international models. But the times, they are changing. Things are really swinging back towards downtown. The pendulum has shifted, um, going in line with many of the other changes that we're seeing in downtowns across the country. More housing coming downtown. Uh, downtowns becoming more active transit hubs. Many of the things that you see here in Ithaca and the things that Gary were talking about, the great things happening here, are happening across the country as people are, are refocusing on uh, pedestrian activity, on being able to live where you work and work where you live. Um, and have a great time experiencing the community uh, in a central place. So we're seeing this resurgence of farmers markets, uh, of, of, uh, of old market buildings being rehabbed and new uh, um, buildings be being built again. This one is in Roanoke, Virginia, a beautiful, uh, beautiful building. Uh, small grocery stores beginning to come into, uh, into downtowns. Um, the big guys adapting to, uh, to smaller town and urban models and bringing smaller stores in. This is uh, how dramatic this change is. This is a study that uh, Jones Lang LaSalle did uh, a couple of years ago, projecting uh, how sales are going to change, food sales are going to change by the kind of store venue, store format in which it's sold um, between 2013 and 2018. Supermarkets, they expect to see a 3.6% growth in sales. Look at fresh format, in essence meaning small, small uh, fresh food, uh, locally sourced stores. 92.2% expected increase in sales. Dramatic, dramatic, dramatic swing. And of course, a lot of that is happening in downtowns. Almost all of it is happening in downtowns because it, it's completely in line with all the other growth that we're seeing there. There are lots of reasons for this and there are lots of benefits in having sort of an, an active, vibrant food uh, and lodging culture and supply base in your downtowns. Food activates downtown. Um, it makes people come, they move around, they, they, they relax, they enjoy speaking with people. Um, it really makes a downtown a lively place, as opposed to many of the, um, as we call the museums of retailing that one often finds in downtown. Um, uh, restaurants and food stores are really lively, active, uh, fun places. They attract residents. People want to live where it's easy to have access to food, where it's easy to get groceries, um, and especially where it's easy to find fresh food and organic food. Um, and you see almost an exact parallel in communities uh, that are seeing an increase in downtown housing with communities that have also um, revived farmers markets, created new farmers markets, um, and created new food stores. They also attract workers. Uh, it's becoming an, uh, a, um, I mean, increasingly important amenity uh, for uh, companies when they're looking for locations to locate in a place where it's gonna be easy for their workers uh, to walk around, uh, to get meals, to have a snack in the middle of the afternoon, to get together with their coworkers for a drink after work. 
Um, and that's an increasingly important factor of that. Um, in the past, I would say, year and a half, I've gotten calls from eight different um, office parks, these office parks that were developed kind of, you know, in isolation back in the 60s and 70s, um, saying that they were having a hard time getting tenants because um, they're sort of isolated and wondering if I could help them. And I was like, nope, <laughs> sorry, you're screwed. <laughs> Come downtown, um, y'all. Uh, restaurants support evening, uh, evening activities. I've been involved with um, the restoration and reactivation of historic theaters for a long, long time. And I got to tell you, there is nothing that supports a historic theater better than a cluster of restaurants in a downtown area. Um, it's a natural uh, synergy where one generates uh, traffic and activity for the other um, and, a, and a whole host of other evening activities that simply wouldn't be possible um, if not for that, for that evening event. And I'm seeing lots of hybrids now pop up, even in really tiny towns. This is a, uh, a an, an opera house that was rehabbed a few years ago. This is in uh, um, um, Greenfield, Iowa, tiny little town of about 3,000 people, maybe 4,000 people. It's called the E.E. E. Warren Opera House. And you can't really, you can barely see it, but on the back side of the building, um, they developed a hotel in conjunction with it. There had been a hotel there historically. Uh, the hotel had been turned into apartments at some point, then it had become derelict. Um, it's now called the Hotel Greenfield. Um, beautiful little boutique hotel that has about 25 or 30 rooms. Um, and almost all of their rooms are booked um, and occupied by people who are going to shows at the E.E. E. Warren Opera House. They, they do a lot of collaborative marketing. Um, uh, marketing. That opera house would not work without the hotel. The hotel would not work without the, uh, the opera house. It's just a natural, a natural pair. Um, and they were able to uh, sort of combine their, um, their financing for it use tax credits together, it was just a good deal all around. Restaurants return a higher percentage of their revenues to the region than most other retail businesses. I was doing an analysis recently for a community that has um, uh, passed one of these ordinances that I, I really like that um, uh, requires that uh, if a business of, um, of a new business of a certain size, like larger than 10,000 or 25,000 square feet, wants to come into the community, that developer, that, that retailer, has to demonstrate that there's market demand to support that much square footage without hurting um, any existing businesses. Um, it's kind of a good sound practice to make sure that you're not flooding your, uh, your retail market with too much retail space. Um, and they were looking at a 25,000, a proposal for a 25,000 square foot grocery store. And this was a tiny town, it was about 6,000 people, and they just didn't believe they could really support that. So they hired me to do an analysis. And I knew sort of intuitively, just from my work over the years, um, that things like restaurants and things like grocery stores um, get an increasing amount of their, of their produce locally. And so you're sourcing a lot of that stuff locally, and so you're supporting the economy locally, more so than if it were a clothing store or something or a furniture store. Um, that didn't have as rapid turnover and whose merchandise came from someplace far away. I was staggered by what the impact was um, of uh, local groceries and how there really was no market demand for that additional store because the existing ones were, were doing well and they were returning such a higher percentage to the community. I would say, and this is just a number I'm pulling out of my hat, but I would say on average um, that a, um, a chain restaurant which is getting its food from uh, other places, you know, sent in from some home office distribution center is probably returning about 20, 25 percent of its uh, of its profits to the community, and it's mostly in the form of labor and utilities. Um, whereas a local restaurant is probably returning something like 75 or 80 percent of its profits um, to the to the area, to the region, because that food is locally produced and because um, they're hiring local staff. Um, you don't see that happening with other kinds of retail stores, which are of course important to downtowns. Um, but restaurants uh, and food stores are really, really big economic engines, um, disproportionately so, uh, for their communities um, because things are, are coming from a farther area. Third spaces um, make communities culturally and, so and socially healthier. There are lots and lots of uh, studies and books that have come out about this uh, recently. The guy who wrote Bowling um, Alone has written, has, um, and produced a new book recently uh, talking about exactly this, Bob Putnam. Uh, a third space uh, is, you know, a, a first space is your home, a second space is your workplace. A third space is a space where people get together casually um, and mingle and get together with friends and just kind of relax and have a good time. That's where a lot of interchange of ideas happens. That's where a lot of creation uh, and um, 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 creative energy happens. And that happens very, very often in, in um, 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 restaurants. Um, it's not going to happen in a place like a McDonald's where you're not going to exactly mingle, but it might happen in a place like this where you're going to sit for a while uh, and have a good time. Um, they make places 
uh, culturally and socially healthier because of that interchange of ideas and the, ex the experience of being uh, connected to other people in a community. Another great reason to have uh, more and stronger and more vibrant restaurants in the downtown. Restaurants, probably more than any other business that you have in your community, uh, reflect local, um, a local culture, uh, history, and culinary traditions. Um, you can tell by the restaurants that you see in a community uh, what the local food sources are, what the local preferences are, what the local um, uh, heritage traditions are, what the, uh, the ethnicity of the area is. You see it reflected in the kind of food. And you know, when you think of some of the sort of classic beloved, most beloved restaurants in America, things like the Cattleman's Cafe in Oklahoma City, Jim Steaks in Philadelphia, uh, Ben's Chili Bowl in Washington, D.C. Um, these really tell a story about the communities where they are in a way that you're not going to experience here. Where's McDonald's from, you know? Olive Garden, Italy, right? Pizza Hut, um, Outback Steakhouse. A completely homogenous experience. It, um, I'm going to one of these places, you learn nothing um, about a community or its heritage, or at least nothing good that you might want to know, but um, locally uh, developed restaurants really tell a story that's an important one. Restaurants and lodging are symbiotic partners, like I mentioned. Um, hotels and inns are a great fit for underused spaces downtowns. Um, I stay in lots of hotels. The ones that I find most interesting are the ones that are sort of tucked away in the upper floor spaces of downtown buildings or the ones that are tucked away in uh, buildings on the side streets. Um, whose original use is probably no longer viable in the community. This is a, a building, this is a, an inn uh, in Marshalltown, Iowa called Tremont on Main. Um, it's on Main Street. It's actually the, the upper floors of these three buildings on the left. Um, it has a fun story. The, the guy who, uh, so this guy was, this is like 30 years ago, he was driving around uh, trying to find a parking space in um, downtown Marshalltown. He was a salesman. I forget what he sold. It was something really weird like refrigerators or something. Anyway, he's driving around looking for a parking space and it's a snowy day and they've got snow banks and he can't find a parking space and his car gets stuck and he's spinning in the slush and this woman um, comes by and asks if he needs some help and so she gives him a help kind of pushing the car out of the slush and gets a parking space. Um, and lo and behold, they fall in love and they move to uh, Boston where she was from. She was visiting her family uh, in Marshalltown. He wasn't from there. And they moved to Boston for a while and they lived on Tremont Street and so they decided later in life to come back to Marshalltown, start a little hotel and they call it Tremont on Main. So there it is. Cute little story. The ground floors of each of these um, buildings is a different restaurant. So one of them is a sort of nice upscale white tablecloth restaurant. Uh, one of them is a sort of a, a, a grill cafe for breakfast and lunches and the other one is a sports bar that's open in the evening. So they're really kind of spanning uh, the experiences and getting, uh, you know, offering things to a lot of different people. Um, they do catering, they have meeting rooms in the back. Uh, the owners themselves live on the top floor of this building. Uh, they grow some of the produce for the restaurant below it on the roof of their, of their building. Uh, it's sort of a completely integrated thing and extremely, extremely profitable. And, you know, there's, there, there's you know, it's a, it's a nice town, but it's shrinking in population, not really demand for new housing. They would have struggled to have put apartments or condos in the upper floors, um, but an inn was just a, a, a great use for it. Uh, there's what some of the rooms and the hallways look like upstairs. Beautiful, beautiful building. Uh, another example, this is a, a, a former shoe factory. This is in Lynchburg, Virginia, uh, called the Craddock Terry, now a great hotel with a shoe theme. If you're uh, into shoes, this is the place you want to stay because they have all the old... Uh, historic shoe lasts and, and machinery there uh, to, uh, to decorate the place. Uh, restaurants boost downtown's capital value. Um, one of the, the challenging things about restaurants sometimes is that they're very uh, capital intensive businesses to start up. Um, it takes a major investment in uh, fixtures and furnishings and it takes time to build up a clientele. But in the process of building those restaurants, you really are increasing the capital value of a downtown in a way that may not happen from uh, a building that requires less capital to get going. And the same can be said for lodging facilities in downtowns. Um, maybe one of the more important things and reasons to really pay attention to this, to actively sort of growing uh, your restaurant and lodging base in your downtowns, is that food services create uh, a tight, interconnected local economic ecosystem. Um, they rely on local suppliers, they rely on local labor sources, they rely on local talent, they rely on local marketing, uh, they, and, they, and they build together this support network. I was in um, Cooper, oddly named Cooperstown yesterday, where there's a new distillery um, in town, which is a 
great place. I highly recommend it. They sell uh, whiskey in bottles that are shaped like baseballs. Round, round, and the, the bottom of them, the base of it, is a baseball diamond. So it's, it's, it's really, it's clever. Um, anyway, they are, they're, they're finding their distillery is having a barrel shortage, um, which is sort of a global phenomenon right now, in large part because the market for Scottish single malt whiskey has soared uh, in recent years, driven largely by India and China. Um, and so the Scots have bought up all the barrels in America. So every Arkansas barrel is getting shipped to Scotland. And American distilleries, which are, are growing at a rapid race, um, you know, uh, things like um, um, uh, wineries and wine tasting rooms are so, are so 2010 now. Um, the, uh, distilleries are the thing. But they're having a hard time uh, getting barrels. So they're looking at starting a, a coopery in Cooperstown. Painted post. I kind of like that, you know. It's, it's kind of cool. Um, so, you know, this, this whole interconnected uh, network, you see that in places like this, where you've got classes and you've got an incubator and you've got a restaurant and you've got meeting space. And when I think about the businesses that I've seen in downtowns over the years, it's just a smattering of food-related businesses uh, that I see pop up in communities that have a pretty tight, successful, vibrant network of downtown restaurants. It naturally spins off all sorts of support businesses and support industries, and in that way um, is a really great economic generator and job generator uh, beyond what uh, other kinds of downtown businesses might be. Um, I'm seeing lots of uh, business incubators pop up, much like this one. This is Hope in Maine. This is in uh, um, uh, Warren, Rhode Island. Uh, it's located in an old school on the edge of the downtown. These are all, you know, all, um, um, almost all in downtowns. Uh, La Cocina in San Francisco, I mentioned uh, last year, they have a, a great incubator uh, program that focuses uh, exclusively on helping low and moderate income women uh, establish food related businesses and they back that up by doing an annual food festival uh, where people can sample food from all the different businesses that they've incubated there. Uh, this is one in Muncie, Indiana which is done uh, in conjunction with a community college, Ivy Tech Community College, much like uh, your facility here is done in conjunction with um, uh, uh, Tompkins Cortland Community College. Uh, great, great partnerships for that. Um, and this is growing, this kind of idea of an incubator is growing in a lot of places. This is what they call the, the East Baltimore Food Hub. This is a, uh, it, uh, in, um, um, in operation in Baltimore now. This was a couple of years ago, this schematic, but it's actually in place. And it includes everything from uh, a, 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 a tiny farm where they can grow food, a greenhouse where they can grow food year round, uh, test kitchens, um, a shared community kitchen where people can have a membership and make food there on their own. Uh, to do sort of small batches, a small production, distribution facility, um, a complete sort of uh, uh, interrelated network of food-related activities. You can see some of the things they do there. There's a hoop house for growing food, uh, their test kitchens, their classrooms, um, the bakery. Um, another sort of model of this in uh, Washington, D.C., Union Market, was an old um, warehouse that has obviously been painted white uh, and spiffed up and now houses a lot of different activities, restaurants, uh, specialized fresh food markets, uh, incubators, um, pop-up restaurants, and even a pop-up movie theater uh, in there. They use the outside of the building um, as a projector for a drive-in, and so you can go uh, watch a drive-in movie uh, after you've had dinner at the Union Market. Um, I've, I've come across several cities recently. Baltimore is one of them. This is in Seattle that are uh, installing urban orchards. Um, they're basically parks, city parks that are planted with fruit trees that are available to anybody in the community. Um, they think it'll help with uh, homeless uh, hunger, but also just make it a more pleasant experience being uh, within the community, being in this beautiful park where you can just reach up, you know, pluck an apple and eat it. Um, growing number, growing number, haha, -ha, of um, uh, restaurants growing their own food on top of the roofs. This is actually a grocery store that grows some of its fresh produce um, on the roof. So you want some fresh romaine? It's like really fresh. Um, there they are setting it up. Um, here's a restaurant that's uh, growing a lot of its produce uh, on its roof. Uh, this is a restaurant, I love this. They, they grow the herbs that they use for their cooking um, in the restaurant, but then they also have this sort of clipping table. And as you leave uh, after your meal, you're welcome to like, you know, snip some herbs to take home for your own meal the next night. Um, food marketing, and this is something where um, downtown organizations and preservation organizations uh, can play an active role. Um, is, of course, an, impart, an, an important component of this. And there are lots of cool stories coming out. This is one of my favorites. This is um, uh, Smith Island cake. Smith Island is an island in the middle of the Chesapeake. 
It was uh, settled by the English in the 16 teens, so it goes way back. Um, and then it kind of like people forgot about them and they were kind of like floating out there for a few centuries. And so the, the uh, English they speak is closest to Elizabethan English on earth. It's, a, it's kind of a weird, a weird uh, thing. Um, and the women there for hundreds of years have been making these cakes that have like 13 layers. And the reason they do it, they figured out, was that the icing um, preserves the cake. So when their men go off on their oyster boats for a couple of weeks at a time, these cakes will stay fresh uh, for a couple of weeks. So a few years ago, this guy from Baltimore was down on the eastern shore of Maryland, and he went out and visited um, Smith Island, and he thought, this is a pretty cool thing. We should, and they're, you know, these women are like baking these cakes there, but they're making like maybe, I don't know what, 50 a week or something of these cakes. He was like, we could ramp this up. So he starts hiring like every high school graduate on Smith Island to get involved in this company uh, called Smith Island Cakes, which is a, a community-owned uh, company. It sort of operated as a, as a co-op. And the thing that I love that they did was they, they decided to have this designated the Maryland State Cake. So if they go to the Maryland State Legislature one day and they have a cake for every single legislature and these sweet women come in and they give them these cakes and they, they sweet talk these legislatures and uh, they didn't stand a chance. And so now it's the official uh, state cake of Maryland, the only state in the country that has an official state cake. Great marketing campaign, Smith Island Cakes. Um, this is its third year of operation and it's topping five million in revenues this year. Um, uh, packing these in dry ice and shipping cakes uh, all over the country. You can get one delivered to your door by tomorrow. Um, lots of similar successes like that. This is in Quero, Texas, where they have uh, a business that just started out as a local downtown restaurant and now has turned into a major um, online uh, retailer of pecan specialties. Uh, another example from Texas, this one is in um, Pleasant, Texas, uh, of a woman named uh, Laura who makes uh, custom cheesecakes and ships them all over the world. Um, you know, really, really doesn't take a lot, you know, a good business plan, uh, a larger, perhaps shared community kitchen to really push these things and, and, and um, um, turn um, um, a local business into a big uh, international enterprise. Uh, distilleries, custom distilleries are, are growing at an, at an amazing rate. I would have guessed probably five years ago I knew of three or four distilleries in downtowns and now I could probably make a list of 200. Um, they're growing pretty quickly. Um, what kind of tools help with this? Uh, there's all kinds of things that can help. Money, of course, and helping with financing to get restaurants and uh, lodging facilities established. Uh, one of my favorite examples, and I mentioned this um, a year or two ago here, is a program in uh, Winston-Salem, North Carolina that they call their Restaurant Row Program. They created it because they had a block of buildings on the edge of the downtown that was almost completely vacant and it was attracting um, graffiti and vagrants and um, windows were getting smashed out. And they thought that if they could get a group of restaurants to locate there together, they were targeting seven restaurants, to come there together at the same time, that it would be enough of a critical mass that it could really turn the corner um, for that block. So what they did was they went to um, established restaurateurs and asked them if they would open a second restaurant there. They didn't want people who were brand new to this. They wanted people who had some skills under their belts. Um, two local banks um, offered to loan money for this and the restaurateurs could borrow up to 70% of what they needed. They had to put in 30% um, of their own cash or equity from uh, investment partners that they found on their own. Um, they could borrow 70%, and then the city used some of its block grant money. It had $1.6 million in block grants. It could be any kind of money. It could be bid money or whatever. Um, used this money to basically pay the first two years of loan repayments for these restaurants. It's so expensive to get a restaurant started with the equipment and the furnishings and the, the time it takes to build a clientele that um, those first two years of debt can be crushing if you're, if you're having to deal with that while you're also building the business. So this basically took the pressure off those restaurants for the first two years, made it easy for them to get established. Um, it wasn't a gift. They had to then pay, the, pay that two years back at the end of that 10-year uh, loan period, so it went into 12 years. But it really gave them the breathing room. And this has been in place for more than a decade now and is um, uh, going swimmingly. Um, Mobile, Alabama, uh, Waterville, Maine, Louisville have done uh, forgivable loan programs um, for businesses that meet certain criteria that locate downtown and all three of them have prioritized uh, restaurants and food markets um, as stores among their, their, their um, um, biggest priority and they've been very successful in getting them. Allentown, Pennsylvania um, has taken a kind of a slightly different approach to this providing all kinds of job credits essentially creating um, a zone, um, an overlay zone for restaurants in the downtown area and you know pushing every kind of incentive they can think of um, into that zone 
to encourage restaurants to open there. Um, that's also been successful. Um, crowdfunding, we've talked about, uh, I think, over the past two years in different contexts. Um, finally, just a few months ago, the final regs came out for, uh, in conjunction with the American Jobs Act, for how communities can create their own crowdfunding platforms and how local businesses uh, can attract local capital um, to start or to expand businesses. Businesses will be able to raise a uh, million dollars a year from local investors. Uh, the amount that local investors can invest in businesses that they support or want to see started uh, kind of varies. It depends on uh, what their assets are and their earnings are, but it's basically between $2,500 and $10,000 per person uh, per business per year. A great source of community capital, and for a, a business like a restaurant or a, f um, a food market, you've got a built-in shopping base if you've got a group of investors locally who are supporting this thing. Um, there have already been some great successes of, of restaurants <coughs> that are raising money on uh, crowdfunding platforms. This is a bakery in California that raised money on Kickstarter. Um, there's their Kickstarter page. They raised a, a, a little bit more than they needed. Their goal was 20000 They raised 21000 bucks. Um, pre-selling things and selling uh, the naming rights to different food items, uh, pre um, and pre-selling things like cooking lessons and parties in the space. Um, this is an example of a, a coffee shop that was closing. Uh, the owners were retiring, they weren't interested in it, and the community just could not believe they were not going to have this coffee shop anymore. So the community started a crowdfunding uh, uh, program to bring back the White Hart Cafe, and they successfully did so and found a new owner for it. They, or, or, a, a manager for it, the community owns the restaurant now. Um, but I'm now seeing specialized uh, crowdfunding platforms uh, pop up specifically for food service businesses. Um, you know, things like Kickstarter and Indiegogo, kind of anybody can be there. I've seen several that are now specific to uh, restaurants and specific to food markets and to farmers and specialized produce production and specialized aspects um, of the food industry. This one's called Barn Raiser. It's based in um, North Carolina. This is one of the businesses that they've uh, recently sponsored called The Farmer and the Larder, um, which is a, a restaurant which is now offering cooking classes and also beginning to package some of the products that they produce in their kitchen um, and sell them through a network of grocery stores uh, throughout the Carolinas and Georgia. Um, this is one that's, that's being launched next month called Fund a Feast. Uh, this is one called Food Angels. This is actually um, a food accelerator. So think about a business accelerator, which, be, which um, brings together co-working space, sort of a shared workspace, a group of mentors who are highly skilled who can provide guidance um, to people going through a program, a structured program that usually lasts between 10 and 12 weeks where you go to classes, you meet with your mentors and perfect your business plan and perfect your product, and then um, an injection of capital at the beginning to support the, the birth of this enterprise uh, and introduction to investors at the back end um, so that the project can get funded if it really is viable. Um, uh, typically what, uh, what accelerators do is they invest between twenty-five dollars and $50,000 up front in the business in exchange for usually a 7 or 8 percent ownership share, uh, equity share in the business once it's launched. Um, this one is Food Angels. They're invest um, um, I'm investing $50,000 for an 8 percent uh, share starting up. Um, Foodies, uh, um, Equity Eats is another one. They're looking for people who uh, love local food culture to invest in this. Um, the Good Food Business Accelerator. Um, they're great because they have a, a specialized team of mentors who really, really understand the business. This one, the Good Food Business Accelerator, its team of mentors includes um, either Ben or Jerry, I forget which one, but one of the guys who founded Ben and Jerry, uh, somebody from the Food Network, um, a, a, sh uh, a, a former like big instructor from the Culinary Institute of America. I mean, really great, great names um, are helping these people launch these new restaurants, launch, um, and launch these food services. There are also some that are interested not so much in the restaurants, but in, in the entire supply system around them, uh, and making sure that a community has the balance that it needs to supply uh, the amount and the, the type of food um, that its food stores and its restaurants need. Um, food X Summer uh, Accelerator, there's just a bunch of these. Another thing that downtown programs can do and uh, preservation programs can do is to help sort of cut the tape on getting food production businesses back into downtowns. Downtowns used to have tons of these. This is a, a brewery. This is actually the Yingling Brewery in, in Pennsylvania. This is a, an ice cream plant. This is also in Pennsylvania, Pottsville, Pennsylvania. Um, this is in Pottstown. This is in Pottsville. Painted post, you know, whatever. Somebody saw a pot. Let's have two different towns. Uh, uh, Coca-Cola bottling companies were in lots of communities. 
over the years, one of the things that we did that was kind of stupid in the 1950s and 60s was communities began changing their zoning laws um, to zone out these sort of, you know, sort of small industrial uses out of downtowns, including a lot of food production. So uh, some communities are running into trouble trying to get things like breweries and commercial bakeries back into their downtowns because they're now they're they're, they're um, um, classified as industries um, and zoning prevents it. So. You know, take a good look at your zoning uh, planning and land use laws, zoning codes, and make sure that they really are uh, open to and encouraging um, of food-related enterprises back in the downtown. Um, food trucks. Are food trucks controversial in any of your communities? People love them. Do they hate them? Both? Love them and hate? Love, hate? Yes. Love, hate? Any loves? Okay. Any hates? Some of you had your hand up twice. Okay. That's, that's cool. <laughs> Yeah, there. You know, some communities think that they're kind of like taking business away from uh, restaurants that are already there. Some of them think they create too much of a barrier in the street. There are all kinds of things about food trucks. I saw a really cool thing in Cooperstown yesterday. Cooperstown doesn't allow food trucks, so this this restaurateur has started a restaurant downtown called Food Truck, and it's like a teeny tiny little space. It's like as big as this podium, kind of. It's microscopic, and um, uh, it sells food truck food, and uh, it even uses a you know square to process. Credit cards, just like the food trucks do. It's, I thought it was pretty, pretty good, pretty good idea. Um, some very cool lodging concepts out there too that I just wanted to mention. Um, I know we're running late, so I'm going to wrap up in a second. But this is a, a kind of a fun one. This is a, 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 a historic inn, a small inn in Lada, South Carolina. Um, and Lada is in the middle of nowhere, and it's a tiny town. And they knew that they would never be the guy who bought this house. His, he, he and his, his, uh, his brother and his wife. Uh, loved the house. Uh, it's right on the edge of the downtown. Uh, they wanted to preserve it. They wanted to have a restaurant and they wanted to have an inn. Um, but they knew that to make the restaurant and the inn work, they were going to have to come up with something clever. They had to keep food costs down and they had to uh, be able to generate a full, a full seating for dinner. So what they do is they advertise that the first person who um, books a dinner reservation there can determine what the entree for the night is. And they serve uh, basically that one entree and you can ask for if you're you know have special needs you can ask for that but that one entree and they have this like you know their chef like has a Michelin star I mean this guy is like a great great chef so everybody wants like for their birthday they want to be the one to call the the entree for the night and of course they then invite all their friends and their friends occupy all the rooms and it all works perfectly they keep food costs down they book the place every night and they're booked months in advance from people who want you know the special veal parmigiana or the special whatever it might be Really, really cool, interesting concept. So help businesses hone their business plans. Um, build new markets. Get food out to people in new ways. We used to offer food deliveries all the time. Uh, a lot of uh, restaurants and grocery stores are beginning to do that now in downtowns. Um, I've shown this example before. I love it. It scares some people. It's a butcher shop that has a refrigerated vending machine outside. So when they close every day at you know, 4.55 p.m., uh, they load it up. And uh, you can, if you get by there at 5.02, you can still get your fresh hamburger for the night. Uh, right there. Opening new distribution channels uh, for existing businesses. Promoting the food that you have. There are so many downtown food festivals now and they're all just wonderful, wonderful things uh, to experience. One of my favorites is this one in Pasadena, California, um, which has some great restaurants and has a uh, um, Cordon Bleu cooking school, but you would never know it, or you wouldn't have known it several years ago. The place was kind of very buttoned down, this end of uh, downtown Pasadena. Um, looked a little industrial, a little cold. And they decided, you know what, we need to bring this, this art that we have out into the streets, including our culinary art. And so they have this thing called the Long Table. And it is a long table. It runs all the way down Green Street in Pasadena. Um, their first year, they had 300 people show up for it. Tickets were 75 bucks a pop. Every downtown restaurant collaborated to make the, the meal. Um, this coming, uh, uh, last year, they had 500 people. This year, they've had 1,200 requests for tickets. And they're thinking we're going to have to take, take over a couple of other streets is a long table. It's really fun. Um, I mentioned this last year too. This is a great uh, sort of celebration of a, of a food industry in a community. Somerville, Massachusetts is the home of Marshmallow Fluff and they do a festival now called What the Fluff. Uh, it's in its ninth year now and it has, you know, uh, Marshmallow Fluff tugs of war and cooking competitions and art, art shows and things. Um, celebrating something that people associate with Somerville um, and that they kind of forgotten about. Ithaca, of course, has, you know, Sundays. You've got those to promote. You've got Moosewood. Um, some great famous restaurants are right here. 
that have become sort of heritage businesses on their own and, uh, and worthy of preservation. Um, I think I might have shown this example before. I love this, talking about mixing it up with uh, food and other things in a downtown. This is a bodega in uh, Boston, in the Jamaica Plain neighborhood. It's a bodega. Uh, it's been there for a few years. You go inside, it's a bodega. They sell bodega stuff. But the, uh, in the corner, there's a Snapple juice machine. And uh, there's a, uh, you can barely see it, there's a little plaque, a little brass switch on the floor. You step on it, the door of the Snapple juice machine opens up, and inside it is a men's clothing store called Bodega. Um, doesn't have its own, its own sign, it just goes by Bodega. And uh, people love it. It's thronged with uh, millennials who like to, uh, you know, find the secret way into the, into the uh, Bodega clothing store. So really think about using, using food as a launching pad for uh, some pretty cool marketing and business concepts that you have. Make sure that downtown restaurants um, and uh, uh, lodging facilities are paying attention to social media, that they're um, checking the reviews on TripAdvisor, on uh, Open Table, on Yelp, uh, on the formats that allow them to respond, always respond to feedback that, that customers give you, good or bad, um, and correct problems there, because this really is the way uh, that people are making decisions about where to eat and where to stay now when they, when they travel and go out. Um, with that, I will, uh, I will shut up. Um, it is going to be a hot conference. Uh, you're going to learn a lot about uh, many of the things that I've just kind of given a quick brush over. Um, I encourage you to really, uh, you know, dig into this, uh, sink your teeth into the content that you're going to be seeing, and uh, uh, triumph at the end of the day. Thank you. We, we, we are running a little bit late, but I think we do have some time for some questions. Uh, Hannah? Yep. So uh, uh, you just got a lot of information thrown at you very quickly. Uh, amazing. Um, anybody have questions they'd like to put to, about, about the topic and to Kennedy? We have probably time for a couple. Yes, sir. You mentioned distilleries a couple times. You didn't really mention brew pubs. Oh, yeah. You mentioned distilleries a couple of times, but you didn't mention brew, brew, pub, brew pubs. Haven't had one yet. <laughs> and, and, and I think you answered my question on this point, which is that uh, the experience within Canada would be that 50% of restaurants fail within the first two years. So I take it that by having the vibrant downtown that works, that failure rate is impro uh, improved. And then my last point is that in Canada, there, and I may have the name wrong, I believe they call it Nuit Blanche, and, and everybody wears white to the event, and they, they buy a ticket to the event, and nobody knows until the last minute where it's going to be held. Yeah, gosh, we could talk, we could talk all day about cool, cool <laughs> restaurant ideas. Uh, yes, there is a, and there, there are also some cities in the U.S. that do that, where it's all sort of white night, and you don't, you don't know until the very last minute where the dinner is going to be, and it's a catered dinner. Those things are, and people love those. It's the element of excitement and anticipation. Um, that goes really far, and I think we're going to see a lot more of that. I have seen so many weird restaurant concepts you would not believe. Um, I've seen one where uh, the restaurants are essentially uh, pitch black, and you have to wear uh, night nighttime goggles to see what you're doing. I don't know. I I, can't, I don't quite get that one yet, but maybe they're trying to like, you know, pass off different kind of food on your plate that you don't know. I don't know. But there's all kinds of things. But the, the white night, I love. Uh, I love that very much. Uh, brew pubs are certainly a huge, huge thing. Um, they're becoming so common. I think it's almost like I didn't mention it because they're just kind of common now. But you're right; it's worth it's worth mentioning. And there's a funny thing. I don't have the stats top of my head, but the total amount of beer consumed in the U.S. has actually dropped um, over the past decade. But the amount of beer produced by microbreweries is just is like way up here. So it's the big guys whose 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 product is dropping off, um, and the microbrews are the ones that are that are taking over the market, which is really cool. I, just reiterating actually a point you raised, but I think it's important to reiterate it while we're talking about the craft breweries, and this would apply to the distilleries also on the zoning issue because I know there's a number of municipalities who are present here. But just in my experience, I'm an attorney who do a lot of municipal work, and I actually, one of my municipalities, we actually specifically just changed our zoning code because we were zoning out. It wasn't a allowed use, and that's probably true of just about any municipality that's, that's here, so it is definitely something that if you want these things, I mean, they're, they're popping up, but, but zoning problems are, are, the codes aren't keeping up, or they're not yeah. anticipating that. And that's a real hurdle, becomes a real regulatory hurdle, which this industry has a lot of anyway. 
um, just because it's regulated at the federal and state level. But the zoning issue is something that municipalities can definitely be proactive on and at least try to cure that hurdle. Yeah, you know, and there's so much, like, you know, we could have a session at a conference I'm just on sort of smart zoning, like zoning for vibrant downtowns, because there's a lot, it sounds like a real stimulating topic, but there's a lot in there, like, uh, and I keep coming across things like sound ordinances, communities that are successful in getting a really vibrant downtown, all of a sudden the, the people who bought the condos upstairs are saying it's too noisy, you know. Uh, how do you control that? And there's actually an organization out there called the Responsible Hospitality Institute that deals exactly with issues like that. Um, I see communities that suddenly have like 20 restaurants downtown dealing with uh, problems with grease traps. Um, that can be accommodated actually through sort of some smart planning when you're, um, you know, periodically every 20 years or so redoing your streets and sidewalks to have sort of common um, uh, um, um, grease channels and things that restaurants can, can, uh, can use together um, and building that into zoning. So there's a lot of sort of subsidiary issues like that that we could, uh, that we could talk about too. I also wanted, I wanted to mention just one thing you were talking about, uh, restaurants being more successful in places that have vibrant downtowns. And that is true to the extent that the market provides some of the success for those restaurants. Um, but I've also found that restaurants are an industry where a lot of stupid people think they can run restaurants. They really have to know the business. And so it's important. I'm happy to see places like this popping up, um, incubators and accelerators where people are really getting some training uh, and real world experience before jumping into it because restaurant business is tricky. There's a lot to manage with uh, labor and food, food supply and food waste and all of that that, are, that you really have to finesse. Um, it, here's a, a, a little, a, a simple example. I was working with a community in Michigan years ago. I might have told this story before that had a, um, a, you know, downtown organization. They thought that they needed new restaurants. They'd done some market research. It showed that they had a lot of restaurant leakage. So they decided to really work hard to attract this guy, uh, to come who was in a nearby community to come and open a nice upscale restaurant there. So he did, he opened this nice, you know, French bistro. And it was open for six months, and the people who ate there every night were the people who were on the board of the downtown organization. Um, went out of business, because nobody else was eating there. The facility was bought by a guy who turned it into a barbecue mud wrestling place, which was a screaming success. Um, <laughs> so the, uh, there were dollars there to support a new restaurant, but they were misreading the market. So you really do have to kind of know what you're doing in this. But. Any more questions? How do you, with food trucks, how do you deal with the conflict between the bricks and mortar and the food trucks? And I'll give one example in Washington, D.C. Um, there was this great Greek restaurant that had a bathroom, had sit down eating, but you ordered and carried it to your table. They had outdoor seating. And they were on Franklin Square where there was a density, a concentration of food trucks came there every day. And the Greek restaurant has since closed. Um, the owner would talk to me about the conflict and he would say, you know, these trucks should be at the food desert, which is the mall which the mall is then policed by the National Park Service, who doesn't allow the food trucks. Um, and he said, we have bricks and mortar restaurants here. We need these trucks elsewhere. Um, how do you deal with that conflict? He would talk about his insurance and his labor and all of his costs versus the food trucks. Yeah. Is, there, is someone talking about food trucks later today, by any chance? No other speakers? It's, um, it's, I mean, this is a, a topic we could talk about for an hour or two, and I, I mean, I guess I, the short answer I'll say is that the jury is really out on that. I mean, communities are responding kind of quickly to that problem by doing things like, like requiring food trucks to only serve areas that are, that are underserved at this point, or giving first crack at it to um, existing restaurants so that they're kind of expanding their business that way, or helping people who think they want to start a food truck but they really just want to be in the food industry find some other kind of niche or role for themselves. So there are lots of different things that are happening. Are you, what, 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 what's happening here in Ithaca with it? We have, we have a policy as well. That we, have, we allow food trucks, uh, uh, but the city has come up with a program where certain areas, it, 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 there's certain districts and, and spots in the community where you can do it, and there's mm -hmm. certain areas where you cannot. Yeah. It's difficult, for example, to have a food truck in downtown. Yeah, I think, I think that's what I'm, I'm most often seeing. There are some exceptions to that, and I think probably within six months or a year, we're going to see sort of more of this shaking out and being more clarity, more, more uniformity uh, in how cities are treating it. But it can be a problem, yeah.
right? And, and there's all kinds of like shades of gray in this too. There's a, I've been working with a community in Connecticut, Bristol, Connecticut, which tore down its downtown um, in the 60s and built an enclosed suburban shopping mall there, which then failed, which they tore down uh, about 10 years ago. And so they're rebuilding their downtown. Um, and right now there's nothing. It's a 770,000 square foot blank space in the middle of the, of the city. And so they, they're trying to build some energy around it and they still have workers. The hospital is there and the city hall is there. So they're trying to provide some services to people before they have buildings in place. So they've allowed food trucks to locate there. So they have like restaurants, restaurants for the workers there for breakfast and lunch. But now they're realizing they're not, they're not able to sign up any, any, you know, do any pre-leases with restaurants because the restaurants don't want to come because of all the food trucks. So it's kind of everything in between. I would say check back in a, in a year and we'll see how it's, what's going with it. Anybody else? Um. My own Lula here. Um, and, and ask one burning question I have. I've heard that a lot of um, uh, the reality TV, um, you were mentioning that a lot of people get into the uh, restaurant business because uh, they think they can run a restaurant. And uh, I heard that a lot of the reality t uh, TV is contributing to that. Um, and I was wondering if, if anyone, you have any examples of anyone that has kind of used that reality t TV methodology for investors locally with an investor panel and, you know, restaurants have come to, you know, seek the help of investors and kind of uh, uh, use that interest in those, those things to do it on a local level and maybe with more training. So sort of the mahi-mahi tank instead of the shark tank. Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, um, um, in fact, some of these accelerators are, are doing exactly that, where the businesses, these sort of nation businesses are, are pitching their ideas to, 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 to panels of investors at the end. Cincinnati, I know, has absolutely done that, where they've consciously um, done kind of a, a Shark Tank-like thing for people with restaurant ideas. Um, they've, they've done it in conjunction with a traditional accelerator. They're not focused specifically on food service. Um, but it wouldn't surprise me if they spin off something as a result of that. And I've also seen, lots, you know, speaking of reality TV, um, a couple of restaurants around the country that have cooking shows in conjunction with the restaurants. There's one in uh, Burlington, Iowa, a restaurant called Martini's, um, right in the Mississippi River. is a huge building that it was in. They have the top floor. And as you enter the restaurant um, from the elevator, uh, you basically are walking past um, a TV studio and uh, to go into the restaurant. And you can see them uh, filming shows there that they broadcast um, I don't know where they broadcast it, but somewhere, um, and they get lots of viewers, and that helps build traffic for the restaurant too. Uh, I just one, one more question that I had was: you mentioned pop-up restaurants. Mm -hmm. we, heard, we know about pop-up stores, a kind of a new, a new at least trendy idea. Um, pop-up restaurants is, are also part of that, with the high costs of creating a restaurant. Tell us about how pop-up restaurants have worked and sort of the best examples that you've seen? Well, I think some of the, the, the ones that work best are ones where the cooking is actually done off-site in a community kitchen or in some kind of sanitary certified kitchen, and then the food is brought to, uh, to the location. Um, and it can even be multiple locations. A, a favorite example of mine is this um, guy in, in Manhattan who bakes cookies, and um, he, I forget what neighborhood he's in, um, somewhere near Italy, actually, and um, he bakes like you know, 100 cookies a day, and these are apparently the best cookies on earth. I've never had an opportunity to get one, but someday I will. Uh, it's supposed to be great, but he floats around from business to business. So instead of like having a pop-up space, what he does is he has this window sticker, um, you know, clear vinyl that has his logo on it, and he, like one day he'll be in a hair salon, and one day he'll be in a clothing store, and one day he'll be in a, in a, a pharmacy. And he just puts the sticker on the window so that you know, ah, this is where Bob's cookies are today. And he sells out within, you know, 45 minutes or an hour. The business earns 100 bucks for renting him the space for that period of time. And um, it's kind of a game, people finding the, you know, finding where the, where the cookies are today. So they walk around the neighborhood a little bit. So that's kind of an extreme example, but I think a lot of the, the pop-ups are really ones that are either using portable equipment or they're really producing the food off-site and bringing it there. Okay. Um, time to stop or want one more? We have one more question in back, and then we'll, then we'll break. Take a quick break. I have a question for um, Dr. Jordan. I just wanted to uh, piggyback on reality uh, TV. How many of you have heard of the Beekman Boys in Sharon Springs? That's, that's a good example. It's in Schoharie County. They started out with goats. Now they make soap. 
Uh, they make all kinds of products. They're writing books, reality TV. They won um, The Amazing Race, a million dollars. So Beekman Boys, look it up. Schoharie County, Sharon Springs, New York. That's a great example of using reality TV to improve your business. Let's thank uh, Kennedy for, for her 